Everyone thought that he was a cowardly loser, but he turned out to be the master of the world's strongest martial art. Soren Chu is a college student who lives in the city away from his poor village. He's on a trip to his village because he wants to pay a visit to his grandfather's grave, but on the way he receives a call from the local police chief, asking him to come to the police station as soon as he reaches the village. After reaching the village, he visits the police station, and the chief briefs him with the terrible news that his grandfather's grave was dug up last night. The only witness to the case was a man who was drunk and was resting in the graveyard. He claims to have heard the voice of someone digging a grave, and moments later, all the gravestones fell at once as if by magic. When police chief Su went to the crime scene the next morning, he found that while other graves were just dug up, the body of Sakurin Cho, Soren's grandpa, was missing from his grave. He realized that since the Cho family is concerned, this could not be just ordinary grave robbing because they are a family of powerful martial artists. He was about to give Saran a call about the incident right away, but then a girl with messy bed hair came to him. She introduced herself as Hu Chu, Sakurin's long-lost granddaughter. Su initially didn't believe her, but she had the correct documents, and she also knew the Cho family lore very well. How have I said that Sakurin's only son, Yotoku, abandoned her when she was still in her mother's womb long before he came to this village, she had no news of him and didn't even want to talk about her stupid dad. Su could believe that part because Yotoku didn't really have a good reputation. He tells all this to Saran who can't believe that he suddenly has an older sister. He curses his dad for being a filthy womanizer and angrily leaves the police station to check out one's grandpa's grave. He reaches the graveyard only after it gets dark and suddenly hears the sound of someone digging. Saran realizes that a grave robber is at work and he decides to get some proof. He waits for the exact moment and captures a picture of the grave robber, who turns out to be Ho-Ho. She spots him because he was stupid enough to keep the shutter salmon on and Saran runs as fast as he can. Just as he stops, thinking he is safe now, Hoda leaps at him and hits his head hard with a shovel. Soren loses consciousness and when he gets it back, he suddenly finds a zombie in front of him. He was already freaked out because of it, and then Ho Ho suddenly drives a knife through the zombie's mouth. He is terrified because she looks like the girl from the ring, and he can't do anything as she starts dragging him from his feet. Soren is the biggest wimp known to mankind because all he does is scream for her to stop, and he doesn't even try to resist as she throws him in his grandfather's empty grave. Hovo tells him that he will die because he is in her way, and Soren asks her why she was digging his grandpa's grave. As soon as he hears Sakurin's name from the girl's mouth, Soren realizes that she is the long-lost sister police chief Sue told him about. He immediately starts sucking up to her and calls her his big sister, asking how she has been all this time. Hao Hao simply kicks him back into the grave as he tries to climb out and says that she is not his sister or Sakurin's granddaughter. Soren is shocked to hear that, and Hao Hao starts piling dirt on him. Like the wimp he is, he only shouts at her to stop, but his voice attracts some zombies that emerge from the ground. Suddenly, Soren notices that Hu Hu has stopped throwing dirt on him, and he immediately gets on his knees to bargain for his life. He promises to keep everything a secret if she just lets him live, but finds that she is not here. Soren climbs up and sees Hu Hu chopping down the zombies effortlessly, and that terrifies the shit out of him. He hides while Hu Hu uses her giant ass knife to slice zombies in half cleanly. She rushes towards the crowd of zombies, easily cutting off their heads before hitting one zombie with a drop kick. A bunch of zombies surround her, and she quickly divides them all in half height-wise and then leaps back. The zombies keep coming at her, and she keeps chopping them up. On the other hand, a zombie is approaching Soren, who starts crying and telling it to go away. Hu Hao notices him and kicks another zombie and pushes the zombie attacking Soren before moving back to the mob. Soren has completely lost it now and he thinks that this must be a dream, and he will soon wake up in his college dorm. He tells himself to get up and go to college, but when he opens his eyes, he sees that even the zombies have stopped in response to his grand level of stupidity. Hao Hao has given up on saving someone so stupid, and she runs away after telling Soren best of luck. The zombies start swarming him, and he can only yell at them to get away. Meanwhile, Hao Hao meets up with her boss, Josen. She tells him that they were late, and Sakurin Chu's body has already been stolen by another party. She also reveals that some zombies attacked her just now, but Josen thinks that it is nothing major. Hu Hu then tells him that right now Sakurin's grandson is surrounded by zombies at the graveyard, and Josen panics as he tells her that they can't get civilians involved in their work. He asks what she will do if the boy dies because of her, but Hu Hao assures him that Soren won't die. Josen doesn't understand what she means, but then he hears a loud boom coming from the graveyard and then finds thunder erupting from the ground. He badly wants to check up on Saran now, but all he finds at the graveyard are zombies that have been electrocuted and burned to ashes. Josen now realizes why Hao Hao believes Saran wouldn't die. He thinks that since he is Sakurin's grandson, he might have also inherited his power. 
He finds Soren's college diary and tells Huhu that she should also go to the college. Hauha doesn't even know what a college means, but Josen already has her documents ready for him. The next day, Soren is back in college. He's on a call with the police chief, who wants to ask for his input about the case. However, Soren doesn't want to put himself in any more danger than he recently faced. He claims that he knows nothing about the grave robber and tells Sue not to bother him again. Soren even deletes Hoho's picture from his phone to break any connection he has to the case when suddenly she comes there and takes the seat right next to him. Soren freaks out upon seeing her, but Hoho just politely greets him. He can't focus on the class because a deadly zombie hunter is sitting next to him and he finally works up the courage to ask her what she's doing here. Hoho tells him to let her focus on the lecture and she will answer all her questions after the class. They meet outside after the class and Soren tells Huhu that he hasn't told anyone about her and even deleted her photo because he doesn't want any kind of trouble. He wants to know why she is still following him and Huhu replies that she has no idea what he is talking about. She then takes out the page containing information about her new identity. She reads it and says that she is a foreign exchange student from Taiwan and Soren wonders if she is trying to screw him over. He yells that he doesn't care who she is and asks her to never show her face to him again. How have doesn't know how to react to that, so she calls another one of her bosses who tells her to do whatever she wants with Soran. So she decides to make him her servant from now on. Soran screams at her, but How Hao doesn't mind him. She asks him to show her the power he used to defeat the zombies the other day right now. Ho Hao claims that she knew from the moment she met him that he had tremendous power. That is why she tried burying him alive to see the moment he snapped and unleashed that power. Soren calls that bullshit and refuses to entertain her any further, so Hao Hao draws out her knife and immediately lunges towards him. She tells him that if he doesn't show her his true power, she will kill him. The traumatic memories of a horrible accident suddenly rush to Soren's mind and he kicks away Hu Hao's knife as he tries to put some distance between them. She grabs her knife and realizes that Soren is not a loser like he shows. She rushes at him again, telling him to get serious and Soren suddenly remembers his grandpa's advice about never using his powers in front of others. Even when Soren was a kid, he often got into trouble because he used his martial arts on some bullies. His dad, Yotoku, taught him Kung Fu, which mostly consisted of beating the shit out of him. His grandpa Sakurin was the only support Soren had at that time, and he even punished Yotoku for getting too rough on the boy. One day, he showed him a special move by using the mystic power called Ki, and shooting an invisible attack that knocked Yotoku off his feet. Sakurin promised to teach this technique to Soren when he got the basics of Kung Fu down. However, Soran replied that he doesn't want to learn Kung Fu because he hates it, and on top of that, there is no point in learning it because he is not allowed to show it to anyone. Sakurin sighed and told his grandson that they belong to a long line of superhuman martial artists, but people fear them because they are different. That is why he advised Soran to always pretend to be normal and use his abilities only when his life is in danger. He told him that there are other supernaturally powerful people in the world like them, and if he meets one of them, he must not hesitate to use his true powers. Back to the present, Soren thinks that this is the moment he has been trained for. Hu Hao is dashing towards him at full speed, but as soon as she notices the shift in his attitude, she suddenly avoids getting close to him. Soren gets up, telling her that since she's not normal, he doesn't have to hold back against her. He releases his key and covers his entire body with it while chanting a spell that brings forth his true power. Hu Hao attacks him, but Soren can easily dodge her fast attacks in his superpowered state. She throws her knife at him, but he blocks it, and she kicks it towards him with full power before suddenly appearing behind it. Halvo tries hitting Soren's head using the knife, but he moves so fast that he practically vanishes and dodges her attack. She looks around to find him and kicks him just as he makes himself visible again. However, his key is dense enough to act as a barrier, and he knocks her away. Halvo keeps on rushing at him with super fast attacks, but Soren dodges and blocks them all before grabbing her collar and eating her away. Hoha takes a moment to regain her balance, but when she looks up, she finds that Soren has gone invisible again. She gets up and takes her stance to combat him, but Soren appears right next to her and grabs her arm before hitting her like a man who believes in true gender equality. Well, he still loses very badly, and Hoha ends up tearing through his key and his clothes. Soren can't believe it, but she tells him to be grateful to her that she didn't harm his body since he is going to be her servant from now on. He refuses to oblige, but then she points out his tiny third leg, and just by taking one look at it, she can tell that Soren is a virgin. He freaks out as Hu Hao threatens to tell the entire college that he is a pathetic virgin, and gives up and accepts her as his master. Hovind was pleased and throws him a Nokia 3310 because he will need an indestructible phone for the mission she gives him. She tells Soran that he will get a call if she needs him and leaves with that, 
Soren is left behind in his birthday suit and he is forced to hide as a naughty couple come there to make out. Seeing them go at it makes Soren jealous and he swears that one day he will also get a girlfriend that will let him hit. At night, when everyone has left college, he's finally free to use his key again. And using it, he rushes home. Coincidentally, the naughty couple from earlier was also returning home just then. And they clicked a picture of the beautiful moon. However, they clicked something else along with the moon. Soren was rushing home at that very moment, and he was caught flying buck naked in the photograph. The next day, Soren is getting bored in class. Hohao says that she has something interesting for him and takes out her phone to show him the picture of him flying in front of the moon. Soren is shocked as Hu tells him that there are rumors that any couple who catches the naked man on a full moon night will always be together. Later that night, he is in bed and his roommates go out for drinks. They cannot even bother inviting him because he is a pathetic loser. They leave and Soren complains that his life is so hard. Suddenly, he hits a DM on Instagram and finds that it is from a really cute girl named Ken. He starts chatting with her and finds that she is his junior in college and wants to meet with him tomorrow night. Soren suddenly remembers the wise words of his grandfather who told him that luck goes up and down like waves in the ocean. So if he has been feeling like everything is going downhill for a long time, good luck is just around the corner. Saran thinks that his grandpa was correct and thinks that he might actually have a chance to score with Ken. The next day, Hulu suddenly tells him that she wants him to meet someone tonight. Soren nervously tells her that he has something really important to do tonight, but Hoha completely ignores him and says that he will get a call. Well, Soren decides to overcome his fears and goes to the location of his date with Ken. He switches off the Nokia phone Ho Ho gave him because he doesn't really care who she wants him to meet. Soon, Ken comes there and Saran is really excited because she is his first date in all the 19 years he has lived. Ken clings to Saran and asks him to take her to a good restaurant and he decides to oblige. On the other hand, Ho Ho tries contacting him, but his phone is switched off. Josen is with her and he suggests that they should believe that Soran has an important thing to do. Hao Hao doesn't believe him and she shows him Soren's location because she can still track his phone even after it is switched off. She asks Josen to drive her to him because she plans to teach him a lesson as his master. Back at Soren's location, his date is going really well and Ken shows clear signs of interest in him. She even invites him back to her place after dinner and Soren thinks that tonight is the day he gets lucky. Ken makes the first move on him and leans in for a kiss. And just as she is about to touch Soren's lips, she uses a special move and hits his neck. He feels like something stung him, but then decides to ignore it in favor of getting laid. However, just as Ken gets on top of him, he suddenly feels a sharp pain in his tool of procreation and immediately gets away from her. Soren asks the girl what she wants from him because he is sure that she is not interested in him after feeling the pain earlier. Ken just laughs as she realizes that Soren has the seal of virginity down there and then tells him that she doesn't need to keep up her act anyway. She reveals that she just planted a poison bug inside his neck and it will start showing effects soon. Ken then summons a bunch of zombies and Soren freaks out upon seeing them. Ken laughs at him once again because she knows that the virginity seal means that only someone who truly likes him can touch him, and she knows that it stinks for Soren because no girl would be interested in him. Soren realizes that he has been catfished, and Ken is also a superhuman like him. He decides to use his key to fight against her and her zombies, but it dissipates mere moments after he unleashes it. Soran realizes that it is because of the poison bug she planted inside him earlier, and Ken affirms. She then asks her zombies to pin Soren down and he asks her if she is the one who stole his grandfather's body too. Ken says that she just did as she was asked to and he shouldn't blame her. She promises to let Soren see his grandpa soon, and then one of the zombies knocks him out with a punch. On the other hand, Hu Hao sees that Soren is moving quite quickly, as if he were in a car and Josen says that it means he has been kidnapped. He suspects the same person who commanded the zombies back in Soren's village. Josen thinks that they might face some tough enemies this time and warns Hu Hu to be on her guard. Meanwhile, Ken has taken Soran to an organization called Zensei. They were the ones who had commanded her to steal Sakurin's corpse earlier if she wanted to join their organization. The genius boy named Ryu had tried extracting the residual spiritual energy from the old master's body, but it was not enough to give him the information he wanted. That is why he told Ken that this mission is not enough to get a Zensi membership, and if she wants to join them, she must kidnap Sakurin's grandson and bring him here instead. Now that Ryu sees Soran, he tells Ken that she performed very well, and by clearing this mission, she's become a Zensi member. Ken finds it hard to believe that there is no ritual or even a matching tattoo that signifies that she is a Zensi member, but Ryu simply tells her to trust him. He tells her that there are no rules in Zensei, and everyone is free to do as they please, so she just had to say that she is a Zensi member and that would make her one. Ken is furious at this because she went through the trouble of stealing Sakurin's body and kidnapping Soren for this, and Ryu only laughs at her. 
Meanwhile, Ryu's thick elder sister, Natsuka, approaches Soran. She gets aroused as she senses his energy and says that he really is Sakurin's grandson. She touches him all over and Soran braces for the sharp pain down under, but nothing happens. He wonders if Natsuka is really into him, but they get interrupted by Ryu, who tells her to stop. He asks her to let him do the more important experiments with Soran first, and then she can have fun with him as she pleases. Ryu tells Soran that he is looking for something, and it is his grandfather's legacy. Soran claims that he doesn't know anything about it, but the boy tells him to shut up before unleashing his power that allows him to interact directly with anyone's soul. He uses his power on Soran, who starts screaming as his memories are extracted. Ryu is having fun tormenting him, but then suddenly, something comes speeding at him. His sister saves him right in time, and a baseball-sized stone hits the van behind him with great impact. Ku Hao and Josen make their entrance, and Soren immediately begs his master for help. Josen knows about Ryu and Natsuka, and he thinks that it will be tough for them to win this fight. Ku Hao tells him that there is no need to worry because she will defeat everyone on her own. Natsuka greets Josen, saying that she has been thinking about him for a long time, and that she really wants to have a one-night stand with him. On the other hand, Ryu is more concerned if Josen and Hu Hao have brought any backup. Hao Hava draws out her knives to fight and Ken decides to face her and finish the job she left incomplete at the graveyard before. So she summons her zombies that erupt out of the ground. Josen wants to negotiate first and he asks Natsuka to hand over Soren peacefully, and he will let her group go away unharmed today. She refuses, so Josen uses his telekinesis power to extract a huge boulder from the ground and hurl it towards her. A zombie rushes to block the rock, but it gets pushed back. However, Natsuka punches through the zombie's head and destroys the rock in one hit. Huho immediately rushes towards her and Natsuka kicks the body of the zombie she just obliterated at her. Huho chops it up immediately and then launches a combo of slashes at Natsuka. She dodges everything and when Huho hits a knife upwards at her, she manages to remain unharmed even as the knife passes from inside her shirt. As Natsuka loses her balance, Ken sends her zombies to surround Huho, but she quickly chops them up before running to her original target. However, just as she is about to hit Natsuka, Josen pulls her back, telling her not to estimate one of Zensi's four top sorcerers, the bone scraper Natsuka. Huhu asks him to put her down at least, but he is sure that she will rush ahead mindlessly. Natsuka takes this chance and steps on Soren's manhood, telling Huhu that if she isn't coming, she will take him for herself. However, Josen suddenly calls someone named Saru, and a pair of hands emerge right beneath Soran and pull them into the ground. Natsuka realizes that all this was just a stall time so that someone could save Soran, but she is not going to let that happen. She stomps on the ground, forcing Soran and the monkey-like man Saru out of the ground. She rushes to attack them, but her punch is a bit missed him, and instead of dealing any damage, she conveniently sends Soran and the monkey man to Joe's in feet. Now Soran is full of confidence, but as soon as he sees Huhu's knife in front of him, he loses all that confidence. He apologizes for ghosting her and not picking up her call and swears that he will blindly obey whatever she tells him from now on. Halva doesn't seem to be in the mood to listen and she puts his face in the mud and strikes him with her knife. Soran screams but it turns out that Huhu just wanted to get the poisonous worm out of his system. She frees him from the ropes and as Soran gets on his knees he curses his situation once again. Meanwhile, Josen tells Huhu to take care of Soran while he deals with Zensi members. He tells Natsuka that since she didn't accept his deal to let Soren go, he will not let her escape. He gives his signal, and suddenly, members of his organization surround the area. Ryu panics upon seeing them, and he immediately runs to his car and yells at Ken to follow him. The car takes off while Natsuka gets on her bike to tell Josen that they should meet in private some time. Josen stops his men from attacking her because they are not strong enough for that, and he tells them to chase after the car instead. He then tells Natsuka that he will settle things with her eventually, and she leaves with that. Soren is still disappointed by what happened, and Huhu asks him why he isn't happy that he was saved. He tells her how his grandpa often used to tell him that when a lot of bad things happen in a row, good things are bound to happen soon. Soren says that it all seems like a lie now because nothing good is happening and no girl is falling in love with him. Hao tells him to cheer up because his luck can't be that bad. She believes that his luck is not the reason for his downfall, and if his life is full of problems, it is because he is a f***ing idiot. Soren turns to stone upon hearing that, but Hao Hao doesn't stop insulting him. She says that he is so stupid that he can't even realize that any girl who gets closer to a loser like him will have ulterior motives. On the other hand, Josen's subordinates are chasing after Ryu and Ken, who have no idea who they are or how powerful they are. Ryu mocks her for being out of touch and not knowing about the company, but before he can explain it to her, a man jumps in front of his car. 
He swerves to avoid him, but the man still latches onto it and tries to stop the car. Ryu uses his ability to suck out his soul, forcing the man to let go. The defeated man warns his friends not to go near the boy, so he uses his special ability to shoot spiritual bullets at him. One bullet hits the car's tire and it almost flips over. Ken is ejected out of her seat, but she barely latches onto the van somehow. She begs Ryu to save her because they are both Zensei members, but he just smirks as he tells her that she doesn't understand anything about Zensei to begin with. He turns the van abruptly, leaving her behind, utterly devastated at the betrayal. The agents report that they managed to capture only the necromancer girl to Josen and he tells them that it is enough for now. He then tells Huvu to take Sorin who has been knocked out because of her insults to his dorm. The next day, Sorin sleeps in, cursing his life, when someone knocks on the door. When he doesn't answer, the door is sliced into two, and Ho Hao comes inside. Sorin freaks out, and Hu Hao tells him to get dressed and follow her. She leads him through the hood, saying that Josen wants to meet him. Sorin complains that he hasn't been able to understand what is happening in his life lately, and Ho Hao tells him that he can ask all the questions to Josen. She then takes him to an express delivery service, and she claims that she works here. Sorin is surprised to see that it is a perfectly ordinary place and asks if they have some superhero secret lair in the basement. Josen comes forward to answer his question and says that they have no such thing as a lair. He introduces himself to Saran and then tells him that all the people in this place have special powers and he sees the proof as a man carries a huge crate all alone. He tells Saran that his grandfather, his dad, and he himself are all superhumans with special powers as well. Josen suddenly unleashes his key and lifts some objects as he tells Saran that all special people can control their key and do things normal people can't. Josen tells him that special people are most often born with the power to use key and Saran replies that it is his first time carrying it. He got his key from training with his grandfather and Josen tells him that training is also one way to obtain key. He claims that he was born with this special power and could use it for as long as he can remember. As for Soren, he must belong to the second category of those who obtain key by training the master. He takes him along while telling him that those who obtain their power through hard work often become greater warriors than those who simply inherit it. In the elevator, Soren asks Josen about the organization called Zensei, and he replies that they do not know about the true motives of Zensei yet. He also explains that there are different schools and clans to which superhumans belong, and they follow the rules of their schools. Zensei members, however, do not follow any rules and do what they want. Soon they come to their destination, which is the cell where Ken is being held captive. Josen knows that Ken is the sole heir of a prominent necromancer family, and she went missing six months ago. Their organization got a request to look into her, and they finally found her with Zensei. Josen calls Ken stupid and reckless for trying to join Zensei, without even researching them properly. She tells him that it is no one's business if she wants to join Zensei. She knows about the express delivery company that tries to control superhumans according to their rules. Ken says she is grossed out that they believe themselves to be so high and mighty to make rules for everyone when they are just the government's lapdogs. Chosen says that she is not exactly wrong about that and then proceeds to make an offer to Ken. He asks her to reveal what she knows about Sensei's motive, and they will be leaning on her. Ken tells him to piss off, saying that they can't do anything against her, and even if they turn her into the police, there is no evidence to punish her. Josen asks her why she is defending Zensei, even though she has just joined it. He wants to know why she is doing this despite being the heir to a prominent family among superhumans. Ken tells him that she truly hated the art of necromancy, but her family practically forced her to master it since she was their only heir. Till the age of 15, she never left her house and apart from her family members, her only company were rotting zombies. She was beaten if she couldn't master the spells and told that only after learning everything could she be allowed outside. When Ken turned 15 and mastered all spells, she was told to live like an ordinary person and not use her powers outside. She was frustrated by that and felt like she was her family's puppet. That is why she ran away from home and decided to join Zensai, because it would let her be free. As she is busy shouting at Josen, his delinquent brother Jan enters the room. He calls Josen a loser who can't handle a single girl, and says that he will take charge of the case now. Josen tells him to get away, but Jan goes to Ken and asks her to reveal everything right away. She refuses, and he just slaps her to the ground. He forbids anyone from interfering and then starts kicking Ken, telling her that they don't need to follow rules like the police. He pulls her hair, telling her that she is free to be a Zensei member, but there will be a price to pay for that freedom. Yan throws her away, telling her that Zensei members do not follow the rules that are set up by other superhumans, and that means that there is no need to treat them as one of them. He says that if Zensei wants to do what they want, others can also do what they want to them. Even as Ken screams at him to get away, he laughs, saying that he will do whatever he wants with her. 
Suddenly, he feels Soren's hand on his shoulder and he tells him that if he wants to do anything to the girl, he will have to deal with him. However, instead of fighting, Soren requests that Josen cut Ken some slack because she stole his grandpa's body, so no one else was bothered by her actions. Josen says that he will let the girl off the hook if she leaves Zensi and promises not to interfere with her activities again. Jan Objectson gets into a spat with both Josen and Soran, telling them that he will do whatever it takes to get the girl to talk. However, seeing Soran so determined to save her, Ken decides to talk. She suddenly says that she was looking for Sakurin's legacy. According to what she heard from Ryu a long time ago, Soran's grandfather defeated 12 Zensi members without taking any serious damage using a legendary martial arts style called the Kitajin style. Zensai has been searching for him ever since, not for revenge but just because they were curious about his power. With that information, everyone leaves Ken alone. Jan says that since she talked, his job here is over, and now he is only interested in Soran. He mocks him, saying that the hair of the Sakurin's legendary Kitajin style is a weakling. Soren tells him that he never learned anything other than using Ki from his grandpa, and he knows nothing about the Kitajin style. He claims that Zensei is mistaken about his grandpa defeating their people, but Ho Hao says that it doesn't matter because they will keep coming after him. Just then, they hear someone screaming from the next cell and Soren notices the monkey-like dude tied down to the ceiling. Josen tells him that he is Saru, the guy who saved him and took Neptuska's punch instead of him. He explains that Natsuka is one of the four sorcerers of Zensei, and though she doesn't like killing people, her power can make anyone give in to their lust and drive them crazy. He then invites Sora into his office to talk in peace. He tells him how their company is working to ensure balance and peace between normal humans and superhumans, and he asks Sora to join them. Soren instantly refuses him because he does not want to do anything that is too dangerous or hard. Josen tells him that the pay is great, but Soren thinks he is just bluffing and still refuses him. Jan is getting frustrated by his ranting, so he simply asks Huwu to convince the boy. She does so by punching him in the face and then beating the shit out of him with a baseball bat. Soren begs her to stop and accepts joining the express delivery company, and Jan gladly gives him his paperwork. Josen tells him not to interfere with his turf, but Jan simply tells him that he has permission from their superiors and that he is going to take Hu Hao and Soren under his wing. Later that night, Soren is wide awake, contemplating his bad luck, when he hears some strange sounds coming from the outside. He opens the door and finds nothing there, but then suddenly, a demon who is hiding on the roof jumps down and puts him in a bag. Soren can only scream helplessly as the demon takes him to his master. Its master is a girl who is pleased by her pet demon's performance and sends him home. She then opens the bag excitedly, because she wants to meet Soren quite badly. However, her partner gets her away from the bag moments before Soren jumps out of it using his kai. He thinks that they are also members of Zensei, but the girl tells him that he is wrong. She says that they just wanted to meet him and thought there was no other way to do so. Her partner adds that they mean him no harm and just want him to meet their chairman once. Soren decides to go with them, but then another person joins the battle royal to capture his attention. An albino martial artist named Ray tells Soran that he will come with his group to meet their master, and while the girl throws a tantrum, her partner knows that Ray is dangerous. However, Soran refuses to go with anyone because they don't even bother asking his permission first. He declares that he will go back to his room and sleep, but Ray was prepared to use force to capture him. Soran unleashes his key as he challenges him to try, but then Ray's lackeys suddenly cover themselves in key two and start chanting the same spell that Soran does to unleash their full power. He can't believe that they are using the same technique as him. On the other hand, Hu also senses an intense bloodlust aimed at her that wakes her up from her sleep. She jumps out of her window and finds a white-haired girl there. The girl greets Hu Hao, who doesn't remember her ugly face pissing her off. The girl says that she is from the Tenj group, and they will be taking Saran with them. And she asks Hu Hu to deliver this news to Josen. She just nods and leaves back to her room, further frustrating the white-haired girl. She suddenly attacks Hu Hu with a flying punch missing the first one on purpose. As Hu turns around, another flying punch hits her straight in the face and slams her into the wall behind her. The white-haired girl vanishes and reappears repeatedly as she attacks Hao Hao, who can only dodge. The girl keeps on launching flying fists and Hao Hao recognizes her as Sane of the Tenj group after blocking a few of her attacks. She tells Sane that it does not matter to her if Soren joins Tenj, Express Delivery, or even Zensei, as long as he is still her servant. Sane just laughs at her and says that once Soren joins her group, she will never let Ho Hao see him again. Ho Hao is angry and about to finish her off when suddenly she notices a burst of energy coming from the distance. Soren is fighting against the martial artists who use the same technique as him. He is overwhelmed while fighting two of them at once and after sending one of them away, he clashes with the other using a full power punch. 
The martial artists return to Ray's side and tell him that Soren indeed uses the same martial arts style as them, which is called the Tenshifu style. Ray decides to join the fight himself now, and an infuriated Soran rushes towards him with his full power. He is shocked when he finds that his punch can't penetrate Ray's defensive key, and then he gets slapped into the ground. Soran can't believe that he got defeated with just one hit, so he gets up and punches Ray again, but is still unable to break through his defense. He is frustrated and keeps on cursing and punching Ray, who forms a giant hand with his key and grabs Soran. He is not happy that an outsider learned the martial arts belonging to his school, and on top of that, he is not even good at it. He crushes Saran and knocks him out before telling his lackeys to bring him along to his place because he is not worthy to step foot in their school. However, Soren has not given up yet, and gets up to face Ray again. He is frustrated because even after finding people who are in the same as him and who can understand the kind of life he has lived, he still feels alone and helpless. He is frustrated because, even among superhumans, he is special even without knowing it, and he doesn't want to live like that. He tells Ray to fight him again, and Ray agrees after warning him that he may turn into a cripple this time. Saran accepts his fate, but then suddenly, Hu appears there, telling him that he doesn't need to live running and hiding anymore because he is her servant now. Soren smiles as he sees her, and she slaps him just because he didn't address her properly as his master. She then tells him that he should not hold back and use his full power to beat the crap out of anyone who annoys him. Saran accepts her order and suddenly unleashes his full power, surprising Ray because he knows what technique he's going to use now. Soran recalls another childhood memory in which his grandpa used a lightning attack on him that broke through his key instantly. So he trained and trained to master it, and today is his first time using it against a person. Soran gets into a crouching position, releasing lightning from all over his body. The lightning intensifies and he charges towards Ray, who blocks his initial attack and decides to counter it with his giant key palm. Soran quickly dodges his attack and arrives behind him with lightning speed. He charges all the lightning in his fist and hits Ray with it, creating a huge explosion. However, Ray soon gets the upper hand in the battle as he uses his giant key hands to capture Soran, but he uses all his strength to free himself from Ray's grip and even knocks him back. He lunges at him with another lightning-imbued punch and even as Ray blocks against it, he realizes that he can't win. The technique Soran is using is called Raiho, which is the highest level technique in the Tenchifu school. Only the head of the school knows this technique, and it is passed only to his successors. Ray is backed into a corner and to finish him, Soran uses the advanced version of Raiho and sends multiple lightning bolts towards him. It turns out that Ray knows the technique as well, and he uses Black Key to send black lightning bolts to counter Soran's attack. He declares that he has learned this technique directly from the head of Tenshifu school as his potential successor. Soran's technique cannot compete with it and gets overwhelmed by the black lightning. But just before he can take any damage from Ray's attack, Huho comes there and nullifies the black lightning with her knives. She tells Ray that Soren is his servant, and if he wants to harm him, he will have to defeat her first. Ray thinks that Hu Hao is really powerful since she nullified his black lightning with just one swing of her blade, so he decides to back down. He then apologizes to Soren for underestimating him earlier and gives him an invitation to join the Raiden tournament organized by the Tenshifu school within a month. Ray declares that Soren has the potential to become the next leader of the Tenshifu school and asks him to prove his worth in the tournament. The next day, Hu takes Soren to a remote place in the hills as per the instructions she received from Yan. They reach a villa and Hu Hu explains that for the next month they will live here and train in isolation. Soran says that there is no need for that because he was almost equally matched with Rei yesterday. He is confident that he can beat him if they fight again, but Hu Hu tells him that he is wrong. She explains that Rei was using only one third of his full power to test him. On top of that, she wants Soren to participate in the tournament and do well even if he doesn't want to become the leader of Tenshifu. She thinks that if he performs well, he will get a chance to meet the current leader of the Tenshifu school, Jijai Cho, who could tell them more about his grandfather. They enter the villa after that, and Ho Hao orders Soren to stay perfectly still. She gets close to him and grabs his face, and Soren thinks that today is the day he loses his virginity. He keeps on anticipating a kiss. But Ho Ho just touches her forehead with his and sends some energy into his brain that makes him scream in pain. Soren falls to the ground and yells that his head feels like splitting just before his vision becomes hazy and he faints. He finds himself in a dark place and his key begins releasing from his body gently and thoroughly. Soren feels a great deal of pleasure, but then Ho Ho interrupts him by throwing water on his face. As he wakes up, Soren asks her what she did to him. Ho Ho replies that she transferred her technique to him. It is already in his brain, and now they just need to train it so that he can master it. She explains that Soren's Tenshifu style and Raiho are great techniques, but improving them will take a very long time. 
Kunlu then asks Soran to try using her technique, and he takes a meditation pose. He feels the gentle kia he felt earlier in his dream, and then opens his eyes to ask Hu Ho more about the technique. He has a spurt of nosebleed as he finds that she is stripping in front of him, and he asks what she is planning to do. Hao Hao just tells him that she is going to take a shower and she doesn't have enough common awareness about not undressing in front of other people. Soren cannot meditate properly because his mind wanders to dirty thoughts and soon Ho Hao returns from the shower. As Soren sees her looking like a proper girl for the first time in forever, his key flows between his legs and Ho Hao senses it. She kicks Soran for being distracted from her training even without realizing that she is the cause of all distractions. Ho Hao covers herself properly but she still finds Soren's key traveling downwards. She realizes that it is because he is a pathetic virgin, and just the smell of a girl is enough to distract him. That is why she decides to deal with the issue and brings two ugly ass hookers to take Soren's virginity. He lashes out at them and tells them to get their ugly faces away from him. The hookers leave and Hao Hao doesn't understand why Soren reacted this way. He gets up and starts walking out of the room, declaring that he is going back to his dorm. He tells Hu Hu that he is fed up with playing master and serving with her. Soran says that he hid his powers from the world for so long just because his grandpa told him, but now that other superhumans know about him, he doesn't need to bother with that anymore. On top of that, he doesn't like being treated like an idiot by everyone, so he's not going to work for anyone now. Hao Hao points a knife at Soran, telling him to get back instantly, but he refuses. He knows that he cannot win against Ho Hao, but he's willing to face the consequences of walking out on her to save his dignity. Hova keeps telling him to stop, but he doesn't listen, and she loses her cool and slashes the house in half. Despite that, Soren walks away and she realizes that she messed up. She loses control over her last few brain cells and mindlessly repeats that she messed up like a parrot. Josen and Jan come there too, and they want to get Soren back using their respective methods. Josen tells Jan that they cannot use force because that is what drove Soren away from them in the first place. On top of that, he does not think that Ho Hao has the ability to apologize to bring him back, nor does she have the feminine appeal to make a man weak. Yan gives Hu a schoolroom look because that is his fetish, but Josen is disgusted and turns her into an office woman according to his preference. Just then, Ken enters the room because she has been working part-time at Express Delivery now. She is shocked to see Hu Hu looking like a woman and learns that it is to apologize to Soran. She immediately rejects the baby boomer opinions of Josen and Yan and decides to give Hu Hu an age-appropriate makeover. She dresses her up like a normal girl, but Hu Ho can't take even a single step in high heels. On the other hand, a car stops next to Soren as he is climbing down the hill, and he recognizes Sane from the Tenj group inside it. She asks him to visit her father once and promises to treat him better than express delivery. Soren decides to humor her request and gets in the car. He soon realizes that the Tenj group is super rich and Sane's dad Hao was the one who built it from scratch. Hao welcomes Saran and introduces him to a reputed superhuman martial artist named Zhang Lu before getting to business. He wants Soran to join the Tenj group and even asks her to date his daughter and Soran can't believe what is happening. Hao then asks everyone to leave because he wants to talk with Soran in private. He claims that he is not offering his daughter's hand to him just for the sake of his powers but because they have a genuine connection. Ha says that in the early 20th century their grandfathers were friends. He tells him the story of how the world of superhumans was in chaos during the time of the Second World War, and near its end, a war between the various superhuman factions broke out, which has been well hidden from history. Ha says that the reason for the war was to obtain the powers of the eight special superhumans. The eight special powers were unlike any others in the world, and Soren's grandpa's Kitajan style was one of them. Hao uses his special ability that he inherited from his grandpa and summons ghosts using another one of the eight special powers called the channeling technique. Hao says that he wants to unify two of the eight special powers to discover the secret behind superhumans. Soran is too astonished by what he just saw and heard, so Hao tells him to take a good rest tonight. The next morning, Soran resumes his training with Ho Ho's technique, but that reminds him of her and spoils his mood. Suddenly, Sane enters his room with a massage girl to help him relax. Soren soon gets the feeling that he's in paradise because the massage girl is also a superhuman, and she adjusts his key channels to make him feel really good. However, Sane is disgusted upon seeing him act like a depraved degenerate. Last night, she confronted her dad, saying that she doesn't want to date a loser like Soren, but he was adamant that she must do it for the sake of their family. He tried to convince her that Soren has great power, and that she would eventually come to like him. Sane tried to talk about her preferences, but her dad turned out to be a top-tier manipulator. He reminded Sane that out of all his children, she is the only one who can't use their family's special channeling technique, but he has never treated her differently because of that. 
He told her that she needed to do at least this much for her family, even if she didn't like it. In the present, Sane dismisses the massage girl before asking Soren if he will accept her dad's proposal. Soran says that it is a good offer to join Tenj, but he can't make up his mind yet. He starts talking about who, how, and how he feels bad about leaving her so rudely. Sain asks him if he would rather be humiliated by the crazy girl than treated like a king here and Soran says they are two different things. He knows that Ho Hao doesn't even understand that she humiliates him because of her limited mental capacity. She doesn't show any emotion so he can't know what she feels. However, he is certain that she is not greedy about his power and maybe she even cares about him a bit. Soran thinks that her voice sounded different when he was about to leave her and wonders if she is actually lonely on the inside. Stain tells him to ignore the crazy girl because he will be dating her after joining Tenj. Soran says that there is a technical issue that doesn't allow him to date just anyone and Sane tells him that she already knows about his virginity seal. He says that if she knows that only a woman who loves him can touch him, she should give up on dating him. However, Sane drops off her coat as she decides to show him that her mama didn't raise a quitter. She approaches the flustered Soran and even as she touches him down there, he doesn't feel any pain. He asks her if she really loves him and Sane says that she is doing this for her family's sake, so she's going to accept him with all her heart. He gets super excited that Atan Hadi is about to give him a free pass. He wants to have some raw fun with her immediately, but that disgusts Sin, and she punches him through the wall for being indegenerate. She yells that she cannot date a pathetic man like him. When suddenly the receptionist comes there to inform her that Hao Hao has entered the building to look for Soran. While Sane is busy, Soran tries to tiptoe away from her. But she stops him. As he tries to make up an excuse, a punch hits him in the face, and he wonders if Sane threw that punch from such a great distance. He tries to calm her down, but she hits him with an uppercut and tells him to talk using his fists if he is a martial artist. She launches a constant barrage of punches on Soran using her powers and he uses his key to defend against them. Sane tells him to fight back because she is a strong, independent woman who wants to fight fairly even against men. Soran decides to give her what she wants and rushes forward to attack her. She easily dodges all his wimpy punches and says that everyone seems to be overrating him. Soran decides to get serious and uses his full power to accelerate towards her. He hits her with a punch, but Sane suddenly vanishes from her place and appears behind him before slamming him to the ground. As Soran gets up, she tells him that her power is teleportation. They resume their fight and Sane keeps pushing him back with a relentless assault. Soran's key finally weakens and she lands a punch on him. She tells him to give up and join Tenj now. But he starts laughing instead because he has realized that this violent nature is Sane's true personality. He gets up and tells her that he can't defeat her right now, but he wants to make a bet with her. If he breaks through her technique, she will let him go, and if he can't, he will accept whatever she wants. Meanwhile, Hao Hao has entered the building to look for him. She immediately trips on her high heels as she reaches the receptionist and asks her to call Saran here. The receptionist realizes that she is also a superhuman and tells her that Soren is busy right now, and she is under orders to refuse any requests to meet him. Humumu apologizes to her but accidentally calls her auntie, which pisses off the woman and she calls security. Two guards drag Huhu away, and she uses her power to instantly dislocate their arms and free herself from their grasp. However, as she lands on the ground, she sprains her ankle because of the heels and falls face first. She gets up and decides to look for Soran again, so the guards alert everyone in the building to deal with a powerful intruder. Hoho keeps on beating everyone who comes in her way as she climbs up the building. Soon, four superhuman guards will come out to face her. The leader of the guards thinks that Huhu isn't so tough, and as she approaches him to ask about Soran's address, he shoots her with an air bullet point blank. Huhu blocks it and then rushes towards him while dodging all his air bullets. She kicks the man in the face and suddenly, the pervert wearing only underwear attacks her from behind. Hao grabs his hand, but it turns out his power is to stretch his body like rubber, and he quickly coils around her like a snake, giving the redhead a chance to attack with her sharp nails. Hao releases her key and immediately knocks both of them back. While three people fight against her, the fourth guy is carefully analyzing her power and waiting to find her weakness. However, by the time Hu is done with the three guards, the man wets his pants. He realizes that he cannot win against her, and meekly lets her pass through. Humuho continues her crusade and soon comes to a room where the famous martial artist John Wu is waiting for her. She says that she just wants to find Soran and has no interest in fighting, but John Wu releases his key instantly. He charges towards Hu Wu and manages to push her back using his swift martial arts moves. Ho Ha can only block his attacks, but as she leaps up to avoid a crushing palm strike, she finds herself in trouble because it is hard to land perfectly because of her high heels. While she is struggling to regain balance, John Wu catches up to her and hits her with a special attack. 
Even though the Hohal blocks his attack, his key travels to her brain and rattles it. She is confused about what just happened, but fortunately, Jong Bu comes forward to explain his technique himself. He explains that his key flows like water around his hand, and even if it doesn't hit the target directly, it still deals damage. He attacks Kufu again, and she moves aside to dodge. Jong Bu quickly spins, hits her belly, and sends her flying. Hao Hao is feeling dizzy all over her body, so she asks Jong Bu for a timeout to regain control of herself. He is confused about her abilities now because this attack would have already knocked down high-level martial artists. Hao Hao then suddenly slams her head to the ground and fixes it. She runs around Jong Bu and barely dodges a knife that he throws at her. She is confident that she can dodge more knives like that too. But then suddenly, the knife returns and slashes her from behind. Jong Bu throws more knives at her and Hao Hao keeps on deflecting them with her palms. She realizes that Jong Bu is controlling the knives via telekinesis, but there seems to be more to it. He keeps on attacking her from all sides by manipulating his knives, and while Ho Vu dodges and blocks them, she realizes that his power is not telekinesis but weapon master, which means that he can use any weapon as a part of his body and control it freely using his key. Jong Bu traps Ho Hu using his knives and then appears behind her to finish her off. He holds her in place as his knives dart towards her, but Ho Ho dislocates her shoulder to free herself and dodge the knives by jumping up. Jong Bu catches them just before they are about to hit him and compliments Ho Hao's strength. He says that it will be a shame to beat her here, but Hu Hao tells him that she feels the same. She claims that because Ken told her that it would be easy to get Soren back if she wore high heels, she has worn them till now, but it seems that she cannot defeat Jong Bu while wearing them. She takes off her heels, telling Jong Bu that if Soren doesn't come back with her, it will be his fault. Jong Bu keeps on attacking her with the knives, but now that Hu Hao isn't held back by her high heels, she is much faster and can dodge his attacks more easily. She gets close to him and lands her first successful hit on him, and just then, Hao comes there to see the fight. Zhang realizes that if he loses here, he might lose his million-dollar contract with Hao. He attacks Hu Vu again, but she simply climbs on top of his knife while dodging his attacks. He asks how she can be so different just after taking off the heels, and she complains that the one who invented heels must have been the enemy of humankind because no one can fight in them. Zhang is frustrated that he is being made to look like a clown in front of his boss, but apparently Hao Hao doesn't want to waste time with him any longer. She requests that he just tell her where Soren is so she can take him back. Jong Wu sees a chance to save face and he acts like he was not serious while fighting her earlier because she's a girl. He asks her to get on her knees and beg if she wants to leave, but Ho Hao is probably autistic, so she puts her hand on Jong Wu's head and brings him to his knees instead. Ho Hao walks away and he attacks her in frustration. She simply dodges his attack and jumps up before piercing his skull with her high heels. She then turns to Hao and asks him if he knows where Soren is. On the other hand, Sin accepts Soren's challenge and throws a punch without warning that hits him in the face. She claims that she won, but Soren tells her that it was a foul start and they will do things properly now. Sin throws another punch and Soren easily predicts its direction and blocks it. She is surprised and decides to keep attacking him, but all her punches are blocked by the electric energy circulating outside Soren's body. She is flustered but accepts her defeat, and Soren goes back to grab his shirt so that he can leave in peace. Before he can go away, Sing stops him and asks him to tell her about the interesting technique he just used. Soren replies that he calls the technique Little White Bug, and he developed it by himself after learning Raiho. Sing is impressed and promises to defeat the technique the next time they meet, and Soren just laughs. Sing is flustered and asks what is so funny, and he replies that she looks awfully relieved after losing the bet, almost as if she was against dating him at all costs. She affirms and Saran says that he was also not interested in her, despite her looks because he wants someone who cares about him, and not his power. However, he still wants to exchange Snapchat IDs with Sane in case she wants to hook up later. She is creeped out and simply sends his perverted ass crashing through the floor, and he ends up right in front of Ho Ho. Saran is shocked to see her, and Ho Ho says that she came here to take him back home. He replies that he won't return so easily. But when Ho Hu bows to him and apologizes, he starts to reconsider. However, he still won't go back so easily, and since Ho Hu seems really set on doing whatever it takes to get him back, he tells her to do as she says. She agrees, and the first thing Soren tells her is to stay right where she is like a statue, while he talks with Hao. Soren apologizes to him, saying that he will return to express delivery after all, but that infuriates Hao. He releases his dark key, telling him to reconsider his decision or fight him. Soren feels like an ant in front of the overwhelming power and pressure of Hao, but he musters all his courage and tells him that he has already made up his mind. As soon as he hears this, Hao disperses his power and laughs. 
He is impressed by Soren's will and determination, and tells him to go home peacefully. Jongub is not happy with this because he is still adamant about finishing his battle with Huhu. Ha tells him that it is enough and even Soren mocks him, saying that Huhu can kill him in just one attack. Jongu loses his cool with that and throws his knives at Huhu. Surprisingly, she lets the knives hit her because she was following Soren's order to not move from her place. Jongu laughs that he finally won, but now Ha is furious at him for attacking an opponent who didn't even want to fight. He unleashes his dark key and strangles Jongo, probably ending his life. Hao Hao starts bleeding profusely and Soren holds her in his arms just as she is about to collapse. The bleeding is too intense and he has no idea how to stop it. Ha touches his shoulder and Soren instinctively tries attacking him. He calms down after hearing his voice and Hao tries using his power to heal Hu Hu but finds that he cannot do it. So he calls his son and tells him to use his spirit under his control to heal the girl. The white-haired guy who didn't fight Hu Hao earlier summons the spirit of a doctor and consumes it to borrow its power. He finds that Hu Hao's heart and liver have been pierced, and he takes out the knives from within her body as he tries sealing the wounds with his kai. Suddenly, a servant comes running to tell Hao that some members of Express Delivery have arrived. He tells them to let them in, but Josen and Yan are already there. Saran apologizes to them for letting Hu get harmed, and Hao also apologizes for not stopping his underling. Yan says that it is fine because Ho came to her at her own risk. He even tells Ho's son to stop healing Hu Hu because from now on, Express Delivery will take full responsibility for her. He lashes out at them because her injuries are too severe, but his dad tells him to give up. Josen picks Ho Hao and Yan tells Soren to stop spacing out and join them. They go back home in a van and Soren curses himself for letting Hu Hu get so seriously injured. Yan tells him to stop being a wimp about it and Soren grabs his collar, asking why he is not worried about his friend. Josen tells them to shut up and not disturb Hu Hu's rest. He asks Soran to listen to Ho Hao's breathing and he finds that she is breathing like a healthy person and her bleeding has already stopped. He is even more confused now and asks Josen and Yan to explain everything to him. He wants to know who Ho Hu is, why she is so powerful, and why she is so obsessed with him. Josen says that they can't tell him too much right now, but they desperately want him to be a member of Express Delivery. They know of his connections with Tenshifu School and they are ready to back him up with everything needed so that he becomes Tenshifu School's next leader. Soren is not satisfied with his answer and asks how they can use Ho Hu as a tool to keep him in check. Moreover, how do they even manage to keep her so obedient? Josen replies that Hu Hao has no memories of her past, and in exchange for her working for them, they are investigating her past. A couple of days have passed in the villa in the hills. Soren sits beside Ho Hao, who is recovering from her injuries. Soon Josen and Yan come there with groceries and tell them to head to college as they will look after the girl now. They believe that she will soon wake up, and then she will need a lot of energy. So they are going to cook for her. But since they didn't bring any food for Soren, she just go to college. He leaves reluctantly, and then the two men wonder how long they can keep Ho Ho's secrets from Soren. Even though he's an idiot, he is bound to realize it sooner than later, but they still plan to hide it as long as they can. Suddenly, Ho Ho wakes up and acts like nothing happened. Josen asks why she did not dodge the attack, and she replies that Soren told her to be a statue if she wanted him to return. She feared that if she moved, he would not come back. Yan is not happy to hear this answer, and she asks her why she is so obsessed with the loser. Josen suddenly gets a call, and he is shocked to hear the news he receives. Meanwhile, Soren is lost in thoughts as he walks back to his college and ventures into the deep forest. Ryu from Zensei is stalking him, and he chases him but gets lost instead. Soren suddenly appears behind him, giving him a mini heart attack. Ryu clarifies that he is not here to kidnap him or harm him in any way, and he even tries to show him that none of his teammates are nearby. Soren asks him what the hell he is here for, and Ryu tells him that he is here to apologize. He explains that he was born with the power to manipulate the souls and key of other people. The reason he stole Sakurin's body was to try and extract the remnants of his key, yet any clues about the legendary Katajan style. Soren asks what it has to do with him, and Ryu tells him that now that they have completed their goal by extracting Sakurin's memories, he wants to show them to his grandson. He takes out a tiny golden light and says that this is the last memory of Sakurin, just as he lost his life. Soren is taken aback as Ryu hands him the memory light because he thinks it might be a trap. Ryu is a pro manipulator and tells him to throw it away if he doesn't trust him, but then he would never get to know the last moments of his grandfather. Soren is still in panic mode and asks Ryu if Sensai aims to collect the eight special powers. The boy is impressed that the loser knows about the special powers, but he assures him that he has no interest in the powers, although he cannot say the same for his friends. He leaves with that, and Soren decides to take the risk and seize his grandpa's last moments. 
Sorin sees that the last thing Sakurin saw 12 years ago was Ho Ho looking exactly the same as she does now. He runs at full speed to the villa because he wants to know if Josen and Yan knew the truth the entire time, and they deliberately hid it from him. He reaches the villa and finds that it is empty and even Ho Ho is not there. He suddenly gets a call from Josen who tells him to come to a hospital. Sorin finds his three friends looking at an old, sick man who is Josen and Yan's dad. He just woke up from a long coma, and he wanted to see the faces of his sons as well as those of Ho Hao and Soran. Soran says that he doesn't know their dad, and neither does he care about him. Right now, he wants to know if Ho Hu is the one who killed his grandpa 12 years ago. The two brothers are shocked to hear this and ask him who told it to him. Soran tells them to shut up and starts yelling at Ho Ho, asking if she killed his grandpa. She doesn't even hesitate and innocently tells him that she was the one who killed him. Soran unleashes his key in rage, but Josen's dad asks him to stop. He tells his son that there is no need to keep any secrets, and then asks Soran if he wants to know the truth about him and Emu. Soran asks him who the hell Emu is, and the old man says that is the name he calls Ho Hao. He claims that he has known her for quite a long time, ever since 1944 to be precise. Soran is shocked as he realizes that Ho Ho is at least as old as his grandpa, and the old man continues his story. In the summer of 1944, Ho Ho suddenly woke up in a cave without any memories. As she roamed aimlessly, she ran into two lumberjacks. One of them got two carried away since she looked pretty and defenseless. He threw her to the ground and started undoing her buttons when a power couple came there and shooed him away. They found that Hoo Hoo was like a doll without emotions, and they took her to her home. That was where she met Josen's dad, Shu, who was just a kid back then. The power couple tried to find out more about the strange girl, but when they got no clues, they decided to adopt her. They named her Amy back then, and she learned to speak and write within a few months and told them that her real name was Hu Hu. However, when she tried to recall anything beyond that, she felt like her head was split and started to cry loudly. Shu's mom sent him to fetch the doctor, but by the time he returned, Hu was fine and meditating. While the boy and his mother could only feel that the air around Hu Hu was different, the doctor told them that she was using Qi, and asked them to keep it a secret from the villagers. That night, Shu asked Hu Hu more about her headache and Kai. She couldn't remember how she learned to circulate her key within her body, but she felt that it came to her naturally. She sensed some key within Shu's body too, and asked him to meditate with her. He did as she said, but could not feel any difference. Ho Hao figured out that he was overthinking things and making it harder for himself to gather key, so she decided to assist him. Thanks to her guidance, Shu was able to feel and gather his Kai. After that, he started training with Hu Hao in secret. They were like a happy family and time passed quickly, but even after five years, Ho Hao hadn't aged a bit. Shu's mom had been receiving marriage proposals for Hu Hao, but she rejected them all. Shu agreed with her because he had the hots for Hu Hao, but his mom just laughed at his childish desires. She thought that it would not be a bad idea for Hu Hao to marry her son if she liked him. However, when they asked her the question, Hu Hao got confused because she didn't understand the meaning of the word like. She scratched her head as she tried to figure it out, so the power couple told her to stop worrying about it. Halva didn't stop thinking about it even at night, and then suddenly got a headache after using her brain beyond her capacities. The woman told her that she didn't have to think too hard and calmed her by singing a song. Soon after that, bandits attacked their village and began plundering all the food grains that people had. Just as they took away the lunch Shu had been saving for Huvo, she arrived at the scene, singing the song from earlier. The bandits thought she was an idiot because of the way she ignored them and decided to have some fun with her. Shu's dad begged the bandits to leave the girl and promised to give them everything they had, but the bandits just hit him. When he tried clinging onto them, they slashed his throat, much to everyone's horror. Shu ran towards the bandits out of rage, but got knocked out with a kick to the face. The bandits dragged Hu Hu away with that, but as she heard Shu's mom crying, she ran to her. She told her that she feels a sharp ache in her heart as she hears her cry, and wants her to be happy instead. She asked her if this is what it means to like someone, and the woman just told her that she is envious of how dumb and clueless she is. Hamavo asked her to stop crying and asked what she could do to make her happy. The woman snapped at her and asked who would kill the bandits who had just murdered her husband if she wanted to make her happy. A bandit laughed at this and approached Ho Hao, but she simply broke his teeth with a light punch. She told Shu's mom that she would kill every single bandit to make her happy and immediately slashed the throat of the bandit who tried to attack her with her bare hands. More bandits rushed to take her down after that, but Hu Hu killed them all mercilessly. Shu came back to his senses soon, and even though his mother forbade him to look at the gruesome sight, he could not turn his gaze away. While normal people could only see Hu Hu killing the bandits, he saw more. He saw the spirits of the men she just killed rising and cursing her before disappearing. The villagers were terrified of Hao Hao's power, and they started calling her a demon. 
They told her to get out of their village and she silently complied. Shu and his mother chased after her and told her that she didn't need to go anywhere. Shu's mom believed that she was to blame for what just happened, because Ho killed the bandits on her command. She cubbed her and promised to find her family before taking her high in the mountains to hide. Shu's mom asked Hu Hu to wait for them patiently, and also told her to promise that she would never kill anyone again. When Hu Hao reminded her that she was the one who ordered her to kill just now, the woman fell silent and simply told her to wait for them. However, she immediately packed her bags and left the village despite Xiao's protests. The woman claimed that Hu Hao is not a human, and even though she cares about her, she is also terrified of her. While Xu and his mom left the village for good, Hu Hu just waited for them in the rain. She survived by eating whatever wild fruit she could find and beating the pandas who came to pick a fight with her. However, as she saw the panda's kid, she was reminded that she must look for her own family. She kept wandering around a mad woman until fate brought her to her old friend again. It was the year, 1993, and a 50-year-old Shu got a job offer to become a manager at the newly formed Express Delivery Service. He got some cases from his interviewer and one of them showed Hu being arrested by the police. Shu was stunned when she saw her and he immediately asked the interviewer more about the girl in the photo. He learned that the police arrested her because she was a homeless thief. She could not say anything except her name so the police put her in a cell, but she broke free from it the very next day without any trouble. After hearing this, Shu immediately agreed to join Express Delivery, on the condition that he had full access to all information regarding superhumans. Meanwhile, Hu Hu was stealing from stalls to feed homeless children but eating all the food herself. One day, she bumped into some gangsters who kidnapped her and sold her to a red light area. One of the customers, there was actually an undercover agent from the mob who knew Shu well. As soon as he saw Hao Hao, he recognized her as the girl Shu was looking for. So he and his men dragged her to the headquarters of his gang. Shu was overwhelmed by emotions upon their reunion, and as soon as he hugged Hao Hao, she recognized him from his scent. As soon as she felt comfortable with him, she collapsed. Shu noticed that she was badly injured all over and her hands were tied behind her back. He was so furious at this that he made a special request to the mob boss and buried the people who mistreated Hu Hao alive. After that, Hu became a member of the express delivery herself, and ever since that day, Xiao has been using all his resources to find her family. Now that the entire story is out, Yan is shocked because his dad never even told his sons about it. Shu simply says that he couldn't trust them with Hu Hao's truth. Soren asks him when this story connects with his grandpa, and Shu tells him to not break his flow. He says that from his research, he found that Shu was involved in the Great War between superhumans in 1944, and one day, 12 years ago, he found another piece of information connected to that. So he took Hu Hu along and entered a forest where the leaders of many prominent superhuman clans were meeting. Shu hoped that someone there would know about Hu Hao, but they soon found the corpse of one of the leaders. Not far away from it, there were more corpses, all belonging to the leaders of prestigious superhuman clans. Hu Hao and Shu followed the trail and found an old master fighting Sakurin. The old master's body organs exploded from the inside, and as he fell down, he cursed Sakurin for being the only possessor of the Kitajan style. He asked him if he deliberately released his location to the world so that all the martial arts leaders would come to kill him and then he would take them down in one fell swoop. Sakurin affirms, saying that they are all remnants of the horrible war between superhumans and that all of them should die quickly with their horrible secrets. However, Sakurin was also on his last legs after fighting over a dozen masters. He sensed Hovu's presence and called her out, but as soon as he saw her face, he immediately recognized her from the war. Hovu was shocked that she finally found someone who knew her and immediately asked Sakurin to tell her everything he knew. He apologized because he could not tell her what she wanted but told her that if she wanted to know about her past, she must protect his grandson Soren in his place. He asked her to keep him away from the conflict between superhumans in such a way that he never realized it. Only if he's in grave danger can she tell him the truth. Sakurin told Hu Hu that if she stays near Soren, she will certainly find the answers she is looking for. Shu asked the old man why they should trust his words and he told them that he was the cause of the great war between superhumans. He then revealed that Hu Hao's lost memories have to do with the war too. And if she protects Soren, she will be able to regain them. Shu asked why he was not protecting his grandson himself and Sakurin showed him a poison mark he just received. He knew that he did not have much longer left to live and asked Hu Hu to finish him off before the poison did. Hu Hu accepted his request for the chance to get her memories back and Sakurin thanked her. He claimed that nothing would make him happier than dying in her hands. Then he pulled Ho Ho closer to her and transferred a technique to her, saying that when Soren enters the world of superhumans, if he is too weak, she must give it to him. Ho Ho screamed in pain as soon as the data transfer was complete, but before she could ask what technique he gave her, 
the poison spread all over Sakurin's body. He begged Hu Hu to put him out of his misery instantly, and she obeyed. She pulled the tiny old man up and then pierced his heart while he still kept asking her to take care of his grandson. After that, Hu kept a watch over Soren from a safe distance and did not interfere until the Zensei members got involved with him eventually. Soren finds it hard to believe all this was orchestrated by his grandpa, but Shu tells him that it is the truth. He asks him to trust Hao Hao, just like she trusted his grandfather once and even if he cannot do that, Shu wants the boy to stay with Hu Hu. He then tells him something special he knows about his grandfather. Shu says that in 1944, one of the members of the Tenshifu clan vanished without a trace and the clan erased all the records of his existence. All anyone knows is that the man was a colleague of the current head of the Tenshifu clan. His name is still a mystery, but Shu believes that the man adopted the fake name Sakurin Chu. He tells Saran to participate in the tournament and meet the leader of the Tenshifu clan if he wants to know more about his grandfather. Shu suddenly starts having problems breathing, and as his sons rush to his side, he tells them that his time has finally come. He apologizes to Hu Hao for being unable to find her family till the end, and then starts shivering as the light goes out of his eyes. Hu Hao gently places her hand on his forehead and starts singing the song she learned from his mother. Xia remembers the times he spent with Hu Hao and his family and passes away peacefully. A few days later, everyone visits Shu's grave, and as Soren lights up some incense, he says that all this time he thought that he survived on his own when he was being constantly protected by his grandpa Hu Hao and Shu. Now, he also wants to repay them. For that, he wants to know about the past and return Hu Hao's memories. That is why he agrees to participate in the Raiden tournament and asks Hu Hu to train him again.